By way of announcements, there are just a couple. The priesthood schedule for August is available and posted. If you would like a copy, please see me. If you haven't gotten one yet, I have plenty. Um, you'll notice one of the entries on the prayer list near the bottom says Center Priesthood. And during the summer, several of the priesthood from Center are traveling, ministering at reunions, etc. Pray for them in these special ministries and for safe travel. You know, even though our camps are wrapping up and reunions are behind us, uh, we do still have quite a few men traveling. As Terry mentioned in the last hour, uh, he will be going up to Iowa this week for four days with Brother Gary, and we would certainly implore you to keep them in your prayers because this is uh, a critical time in our, in our lives, in our nation's history, and in the fulfillment of the word and that the gospel will go forth into all corners of the world and be spoken unto every nation, kindred, and tongue. In, in addition to that, there are uh, Ben and Jerry, not the ice cream folks, but our own bishops will be going up to Idaho uh, tomorrow and will be returning Wednesday. Um, our brother Friday in Boma in Nigeria and another elder, Jude, I can't pronounce his last name, they'll be going to eastern Nigeria uh, Wednesday for two weeks. Um, several dozen or more uh, folks who uh, are looking to be baptized and uh, of course um, the, the ministry that they provide is, is uh, invaluable and their, their safety is a primary concern, especially uh, now with the increased amount of activity that Boko Haram is conducting in that, in that nation and in that part of the nation. So I would just implore you to not only remember those who have assignments here in the center place, and it's a good thing to have one of these even if you're not on it, uh, just to see who is, who is presiding and speaking in the days ahead. And, and to lift them up, but also uh, these men who have taken the assignments upon them and are traveling for their safety and for their, their success. That's all. Thank you. We welcome you this morning, your servants that are up to the front of the podium. We thank you for coming. We uh, appreciate uh, having uh, Brother Steve Timms with us and his family, David and Bonnie. And uh, we ask an interest in your prayers on his behalf. Uh, Steve was a branch president of Blue Springs for three years and he's on the Standing High Council and has been there for many years. Uh, in our uh, call to worship, I've chosen uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 160, paragraph 5. My people of the remnant church, you have been called to the mission of sending forth my gospel far and wide by word of mouth, by the example of your individual lives, as well as how you live in community. The world is in chaos and needs so badly the message of the good news. Be not discouraged, for I will be with you, and the end will be victorious. Remember, remember, I gave my life for you. What will you do for me? May it be so. The theme today in our bulletin is by sharing the gospel. And uh, in your bulletin, the first hymn is going to be hymn number 214. Uh, I was at junior high camp last week, and I was supposed to have completed the responsibilities of filling out this bulletin and getting it to Alex on time, and I failed. And Alex pulled me out of the water, so to speak. And uh, Rachel did too by uh, picking the hymns and Tom Kilpeck. So, uh, 
And Mike Coffey is going to give the offertory because I asked him to do that. And they had us uh, written out the hymns, and I mean the uh, order of worship, which I greatly appreciate. And what this tells me is just what happened down at uh, junior high camp. <clears throat> they saw a brother in great need, and they lifted me up. And we're here today to be lifted up by our Heavenly Father. Let us rejoice and be glad, for this is the day of the Lord. Hymn 214. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we gather here this morning to worship and draw strength from you this day that we may make it through the week. We ask your spirit to be with us and touch us and surround us and grant us peace in our hearts. We ask your spirit for our brother as he brings his message and for each of us here as we hear those words, that they may touch our hearts. And we ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Good morning. I want to start by reading from Matthew chapter 25, verses 36 through 41. For I, I was an hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee as hungered, and, feed, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee a drink? When saw we thee as a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done unto the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Since God's spirit is in everyone, each time we sacrifice our time, talents, temporal resources, and helping a brother or sister, we have done it unto him. When we do this unselfishly, greater love of God is upon us. We should view our daily actions as a service to God. We have to remember that it doesn't really matter what he, what happens here on Sunday. It's how we live our everyday lives that shows the true love of God that is in our hearts. According to a study done by the Hartford Institute of Religious Research, only between 20 and 40 percent of Americans go to church on Sundays. That leaves about 80 percent of people not in church, not hearing the word of God, not experiencing his love for us. So how could they see God's love if that's the only place we show it? During the week is a crucial time when we should be showing that 80% why they should make it a priority to be at church. That same study said that those 80% of Americans are finding something more fulfilling to do. It's our job to be so filled with his love and grace that it it makes them want to be here on Sunday to do whatever we can for them that will help them realize that he is more fulfilling than anything the world can offer. Romans chapter 10 verses 13 and 14 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And that and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It's good that we come every Sunday and that we get to experience this and be together with each other and worship. But those people that aren't here, the only time they get to see his love or his power is when we show them through our actions and our kindness during the week and in our daily lives. And so that's something that I've been trying to work more on is being more Christ-like to those people, even when sometimes it can be a little hard if they get a little frustrating or trying our patience. But that's when we need to remember that those are the ones that need it the most. like to read to you this morning from the Gospel of St. Luke, the 21st chapter. And this is starting with the first verse. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting in their gifts into the treasury, and saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in to the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. We know that all things come of God that we are merely stewards over the possessions that we have. 
and all things belong to him to start with. So this is our opportunity to simply return a small portion of that to him as we are able. But the important thing here isn't the size of the gift that we're able to give, but the size of the heart behind that gift. That is what concerns the Lord the most. The gentleman will come forward. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we ask you this morning to accept these gifts as best that we can give them. We ask that you would watch over and care for us. And we ask that you would bless those in whose hands these gifts go, that they might use them wisely. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our uh, <clears throat> scripture text this morning is taken from uh, Malachi. It's an old familiar one. Uh, verses 1 and, and 3, 1 through 3, and then 16 through 18. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not.
We'll remain seated and sing hymn number 526, 526. We've a story to tell to the nation.
Well, greetings from Blue Springs. It's a pleasure to be with you and share with you here in uh, Center Branch this morning. And uh, I really have appreciated all the uh, parts that we have been uh, attuned to here, the morning worship and the Sunday school and uh, even the ironic moment that was so touching and uh, appreciate this hymn we just sang. We have a story to tell to the, to the nation. We have the most beautiful story that there could ever be. And uh, our opening text uh, this morning is a prophecy that is very dear to us as Latter-day Saints. It foretells of the second coming of our Lord and our, our need to, re, to prepare. And more than that, it speaks to the lateness of the hour and the urgency to get right with God. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will have a pure and a clean people. Being ignorant of God and his ways will not be a blessed condition. It becomes paramount that we who have been warned must warn our neighbors, that we share the gospel with all of our loved ones, yes, and even all who will listen. This morning we will look briefly at some prophecies that, that point to our day, prophecies that should excite us and cause us to want to be faithful and share the gospel, and we will consider some thoughts that may help us in our efforts to share the gospel. Some may be of the opinion that our scripture text refers to the first advent and John the Baptist, the forerunner or messenger referred to. Yet the text says, on that occasion, the Lord will suddenly come to his temple. And it is questioned, who shall stand when he appeareth and who may abide the day of his coming? It would be extremely absurd to argue that Christ came suddenly to his temple in the first century, that anyone had any difficulty to stand when he appeared or to abide the day of his coming. But the day is coming when the sinner will be unable to abide his coming or able to stand when he appeareth. Then they will call upon the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them and hide them from his presence. The second advent is clearly meant. A messenger is to prepare the way before him. And we know that John the Baptist was the messenger who prepared the way for his first coming. He is also very likely the messenger spoken of in this prophecy by Malachi. When John was born, his father Zacharias prophesied about his calling. He said, And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. This prompts the suggestion that he would be used as a messenger to prepare the way of the Lord more than once. In the first century, he did this once. If chosen to do a similar work before the second advent, it will certainly not be in the flesh. Another prophecy dear to us as Latter-day Saints is found in Revelation. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has, is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Surely this prophecy speaks of the restoration of the gospel in the latter days by an angel. And we know that it was John the Baptist who restored the Aaronic priesthood to Joseph Smith Jr. and Oliver Cowdery. It is recorded in church history that John the Baptist said these words when he laid his hands on Joseph and Oliver to ordain them. Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels, and of the gospel of repentance, and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. 
And this shall never be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. It must have been a marvelous experience to uh, have that happen. And I'd just like to share some of Oliver's testimony regarding that. He was very eloquent in his speech. I shall not attempt to paint to you the feelings of this heart, nor the majestic beauty and glory which surrounded us on this occasion. But you will believe me when I say that earth, nor men, with, with the eloquence of time, cannot begin to clothe language in as interesting and sublime a manner as this holy personage. No, nor has this earth power to give the joy, to bestow the peace, or comprehend the wisdom which was contained in each sentence as they were delivered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Man may deceive his fellow man, deception may follow deception, and the children of the wicked one may have power to seduce the foolish and untaught, till naught but fiction feeds the many, and the fruit of falsehood carries in its current the giddy to the grave. But one touch with the finger of his love, yes, one ray of glory from the upper world, or one word from the mouth of the Savior, from the bosom of eternity, strikes it all into insignificance and blots it forever from the mind. Talk about a story to tell to the nation. We have it. Uh, this visit from John the Baptist occurred May 15, 1829. He came as an angel to inaugurate the work of Christ's kingdom in the hour of judgment, the latter days, to precede the coming of our Lord. These are prophecies being fulfilled in our day, the latter days. My point is that the hour is late and our Lord is near even at the door. Our day is a day of preparation. Another prophecy that inspires hope is the one from Daniel. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. God's kingdom is the stone cut out of the mountain without hands that went forth and broke all the other kingdoms. It would be established in the latter days around 1830. The stone smote the image and became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And you couple that with a prophecy with latter day revelation, the revelation on prayer in Doctrine and Covenants section 65. Hearken and lo, a voice as of one sent down from on high, who is mighty and powerful, whose going forth is unto the ends of the earth, yea, whose voice is unto men. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. The keys of the kingdom of God are committed unto man on the earth, and from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth, as the stone which is cut out of the mountain without hands shall roll forth until it has filled the whole earth. Yea, a voice crying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the supper of the Lamb. Make ready for the bridegroom. Pray unto the Lord. Call upon his holy name. Make known his wonderful works among the people. Call upon the Lord, that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth. That the inhabitants thereof may receive it and be prepared for the days to come in the which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven, clothed in the brightness of his glory, to meet the kingdom of God, which is set up on the earth. Wherefore, may the kingdom of God go forth, that the kingdom of heaven may come, that thou, O God, may be glorified in heaven, so on earth, that thy en enemies may be subdued. For thine is the honor, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
our Lord brought his church out of the wilderness in 1830. But the world <coughs> deemed it too small, too insignificant to give it credence as a work of God. But we know the words of the Lord are sure. It shall never be destroyed or left to other people, but will continue to roll forth until it has filled the whole earth. Aren't the works of God marvelous in our eyes? How something so small and that's the way the Lord would do something like that is just miraculous. But it's our story that we have to tell. Last Wednesday evening after prayer service, I sat and listened to some of the speeches at the Republican <laughs> convention. I heard most of Governor Mike Pence's speech. Donald Trump selected him to be his vice president running mate in the campaign. Governor Pence said, what unites us exceeds anything that sets us apart in America. We are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. He then promised to keep faith with that conviction and to pray daily for a wise and discerning heart. He expressed his faith that God can still heal our land. He was sharing the gospel. He implied that we depend upon God and that we need to repent and turn toward him. Governor Pence did not begin in the Garden of Eden, nor in a manger in Bethlehem. He built on our heritage, knowing that this nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. He expressed his faith. Are we sometimes a little overwhelmed at the thought of sharing the gospel? Where do we begin? And what do we say? Perhaps all that is needed is an expression of our faith, how we feel about God and his only begotten son, Jesus. And perhaps a better question is not what do we say, but when do we say it? Every time you walk through these doors, you give an expression of your faith. And not just to the people here, but anyone who sees how important it is for you to be here. Wednesday evening prayer service is specially designed and created that we may have the opportunity to express our faith. How important is it that we be here? How important is it for us to share the gospel? Our attendance is a passive expression of our faith. But when we stand to our feet and share even the simplest of prayers or testimonies, our expression of faith takes action. It's where the tire hits the road. It's been said that prayer service is a barometer of the spiritual condition of the church. Do you believe that? I do. Not only is the content of our prayers and testimonies indicative of our spiritual condition, but also our attendance, our desire to be there. I hear excellent prayers at Blue Springs, excellent prayers and testimonies, and I'm sure you hear them here at Center Branch as well. But our attendance at Blue Springs is not very strong for a group of people who have the fullness of the gospel, the fullness of the gospel of Christ, the people who have received the precious angel message. When I was a boy, we went every Wednesday evening. There was no question, we just went. It's not easy to always pack up and go. It takes dedication and hard work, a commitment. But it pays off. Is it important for children to see adults pray and share testimonies? Definitely, yes. And they see more than you think. As children grow older and begin to encounter problems, are they going to lean upon God or something else? 
Will they know to turn to God because they give thanks at the dinner table or because they attend prayer service? We ask ourselves, why does the church continue to lose its youth? The response usually stems back to the dark and cloudy day in 1984. But when do we get back on track? It won't get better until we get them back in prayer service. Our dependency upon God is reinforced at prayer service. Whether we ask for his help in our prayers or hear loved ones testify of his intervention in their lives, our need for him grows. We learn to put our trust in him and not in the arm of flesh. We are told to pray often, as did Jesus. He sought the quiet place of prayer to know the will of his Father in heaven. Do you think it is important for us to know our Father's will, what we have yet to do? You say, Steve, I can pray at home or wherever I am. I don't have to come to church. Well, I hope everyone does pray wherever you are, but you are missing the Zionic goals of prayer service, to live for one another and unto God. We each are aware of the troubled day in which we live. Will you procrastinate your opportunity to draw near to the Lord, or will you seek him early while he still may be found? And I know I'm talking to the choir, so don't take anything uh, offensive here. James, the brother of Jesus, said, The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do you believe that? Multiply that by the uh, number of people attending a prayer service, and you have a powerful force. When I was a pastor, people would often call and add names to the prayer list. Oh, how much better it would be if they would just come and add their prayer. I believe that if you miss one Wednesday evening prayer service, it is easier to miss the next one. And if I were the adversary and could discourage attendance to only one service a week, it would be the Wednesday evening prayer service. At prayer service, we see faith in action, whether it is asking God for help or telling how God has helped you. Faith is at work. Sundays we are ministered to, but Wednesday we express our faith. Zion will be established by people who express their faith, people who share the gospel. I believe the road to Zion includes attending Wednesday evening prayer service. If you aren't attending prayer service, you might want to determine what road you are on. Our Lord needs each of, each of you to share the gospel. The counsel that Jesus gave his disciples about what to teach the world will also help us. <clears throat> In chapter 7 of Matthew, 9 through 13, Go ye into the world, saying unto all, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come nigh unto you. And the mysteries of the kingdom ye shall keep within yourselves, for it is not meet to give that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls into swine, lest they trample them under their feet. For the world cannot receive that which ye yourselves are not able to bear. Wherefore, ye shall not give your pearls unto them, lest they turn again and rend you. Say unto them, Ask of God. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and unto him that knocketh it shall be opened. Ask and ye shall receive. It's what the disciples were to tell others. Don't try to share the mysteries of the kingdom, but invite them to seek and obtain their own testimony. It's who we are as his church it's who he is as our Lord. Yes, couched in this promise is hope and a deep abiding love. It requires faith in action. 
Ask and ye shall receive is a promise that cries out that he is willing and able to speak to us today just as he has done in all the ages. It goes hand in hand with, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Ask and ye shall receive is a promise that breathes life and hope into his people. On our own, we are nothing and helpless. With Jesus, all things are possible. Because of this promise, we have hope for life with a living God. I hope everyone here has proven that promise, ask and ye shall receive. It's a marvelous experience. Not so long ago, <clears throat> I struggled with the question, how could Jesus atone for my sins when I wasn't one of those who crucified him? I was teaching a junior high Sunday school class and I felt like I really needed to know. So I prayed about it, studied and thought about it and continued to pray more about it. One night I woke up in the early hours and the answer was very clear. Jesus atones for the sins of all mankind. The man Jesus was killed by a handful of men, but it was the innocent blood of the Son of God that was spilt by mankind. He paid the price for the sins of all mankind. Man becomes subject unto Christ. That which was sinful crucified him who was innocent. Mankind became indebted to Jesus. For me, this was heaven sent. It not only answered my question, but also verified James' admonition. That if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Jesus is the Son of God. He was not merely a good man, but rather the Son of God. Only God could live in the flesh and be tempted and not sin. Only God could atone for the sins of all mankind. Only God could bring about the resurrection of the dead. Only God could bring man back into his presence. Only God could offer mercy and not destroy justice. I always felt I knew that Jesus was the Son of God, but it wasn't until I sought him out that I understood it. And my understanding of the love of God is much richer now. The revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who came into the world to take upon him the sins of the world, that whoever will believe on him might be saved and not perish, that is the gospel. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and unto him that knocketh it shall be opened. The Holy Spirit is what wins souls to Christ. It is not so much what we may say or do, but the testimony of his spirit. We are merely the vessels of his spirit. Maya Angelou once said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. It is love that permeates all boundaries. It is the spirit of Christ that changes the hearts of men. So may it be in us as we share the gospel and prepare for his coming. We'll close the service by singing hymn number 193, Redeemer of Israel, 193. And we'll stand, remain standing for the, invo uh, the benediction by Brother Eli.
you, kind and gracious Heavenly Father. We come through at the end of this service. Surely your spirit has been here with us, and I would ask that you not let us uh, forget what we've heard here today and add your blessings to it as we go through our day, and uh, that it'll stick with us, and we won't, we'll get everything you want us to get from it. Be with us as we go wherever we, wherever we uh, go today, and in Jesus' most holy name, amen. <laughs>